Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring it. To support today, I found out and learned more about Brilliant. Go to brilliant.org slash brainfood and sign up for free. Long considered the greatest of the so-called seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis, located in modern-day Turkey, consists of nothing more than a single column of marble surrounded by random pieces of debris. Famously destroyed and rebuilt multiple times over the centuries, the temple is most notable for being burned down by a guy who wanted to destroy the great temple for no other reason than to be remembered by history. In the video today, we're looking at the story of Herostratus. While there is some debate, most believe it was originally designed by the famed Decretian architect Cherisfron in 550 BC. The temple was built to honor the goddess Artemis, the deity of, amongst other things, the hunt, wild animals, and somewhat paradoxically, both childbirth and virginity. Built literally on top of another lesser temple dedicated to the goddess that had been destroyed by floods some two centuries prior in the city of Ephesus, this new, much more resplendent temple was constructed almost entirely from gleaming, pearly white marble with support beams of cedar that had been treated with perfumes and oils. The cost of this marble, an exceptionally expensive and difficult material to work with even today, and the construction of the temple itself was largely absorbed by King Croesus of Lydia, a man who is unsurprisingly oft described as being fabulously wealthy in most historical accounts. To ensure that the temple would stand for as many years as possible, in addition to constructing it from a combination of hard slabs of marble and specially treated beams of timber, the temple was specifically constructed on marshy lands. While this may seem counterintuitive to anyone familiar with the parable of the foolish builders, their reasoning behind choosing softer ground was apparently so that the building would be better protected from earthquakes. To help get around the otherwise inherent problems of building a large structure on marshy ground, the foundation area was supposedly reinforced with tons of charcoal and sheepskins, onto which layers of shale and marble were then laid to create a flat surface to build on. For many years, the only source on this bizarre claim was a latter account by Roman historian Pliny the Elder so there was some lingering doubt that this is how they managed to create a solid foundation. Things changed, however, when archaeologists examined the soil around the temple's ruin and found remnants of carboniferous elements and various fragments of organic origin. Further excavation revealed marble chips were also used, suggesting that this really might have been what ancient builders did to ensure that the temple had a solid and immovable foundation. However, there is still some debate with regards to the use of sheepskins. Whatever the case, the actual time it took to finish building the temple seems to be a matter of disagreement among experts, with estimates of how long it took ranging from 10 to 200 years, depending on which source you consult. Some of the confusion appears to be that the main body of the temple was constructed in just about a decade, but it was constantly being improved upon right up until 356 BC, when it was destroyed by Herostratus, who we'll promise we'll talk about in just a moment after we talk about how opulent this temple was. Roughly 377 feet in length and 180 feet wide, making it slightly larger than an American football field for anyone having trouble visualizing that, or for another reference, about three times the square footage of the famed Parthenon, the temple's most impressive feature were the 127 gleaming white marble columns holding up its roof. According to modern estimates based on historical accounts, each of these columns consisted of a single piece of marble over 60 feet long and weighing close to 100 tons. Exactly how these columns were erected isn't clear, which only made the temple more visually impressive to ancient travelers and worshippers, many of whom were simply awed by its sheer size. By all accounts, the temple then stood without major incident for some two centuries as the jewel of Ephesus, until July 21, 356 BC, when a mysterious figure, identified only as Herostratus, decided to burn it all down. Now, you might be curious, given how we just spent some time talking about how immensely huge this largely stone building was, how a single man would burn it to the ground in a single evening. Well, it turns out, it wasn't actually that difficult. It would appear that Herostratus simply snuck past the guards, placed various oiled rags around some of the wood frame beams helping to support the roof, lit them on fire, and 
then let the magic happen. The destruction of the temple came as a shock to the citizens of Ephesus, who had assumed that the vast temple was largely impervious to conventional damage by virtue of its massive size. What came as an even bigger shock, though, was when Herostratus openly admitted to the crime and willingly handed himself over to the authorities. The braggartly arsonist was then immediately tortured to ascertain why he had burnt down the temple. While being tortured, Herostratus apparently exclaims that he did it so that his name would be remembered throughout history. Fearing that copycat criminals would similarly commit acts of arson or perhaps even worse crimes in an attempt to gain enough notoriety to have their name etched into the annals of history, the authorities saw to it that Herostratus was brutally and very publicly executed. After this, all mention of his name was removed from the public record and a decree was issued that anyone who so much as mentioned his name in public would similarly be executed. This is an early example of the practice of damnatio memori. In a nutshell, this was something various groups have done throughout history, but later on, Rome at its peak made this a frequent punishment, which you can learn more about in our video all about that subject. As you can probably tell from the fact that we're making a video about Herostratus two millennia later, the attempt to excise him from history did not exactly go to plan, thanks largely to the work of the 4th century Greek historian Theopompus, who bravely decided to ignore the decree to ensure that future generations would know the true fate of the great temple and the name of the man who destroyed it. Unfortunately, though, Ephesian authorities were remarkably thorough when it came to destroying any and all information related to the man, though this hasn't stopped historians from trying to infer a number of things about him based on what they do know. For example, it's largely assumed that Herostratus wasn't an Ephesian citizen because he was tortured on the rack, a punishment that's usually reserved for foreigners, which has led experts to think that he was either a foreign traveler or a slave. Slave. Of course, it could have also simply been that the level of outrage among the citizens of Ephesus over the destruction of their beloved temple was such that they may have treated his case especially brutally, regardless of whether or not he was a local citizen. So it should also probably be mentioned that some have hypothesized, including none other than Plutarch, that Herostratus may have got the idea to acquire a bit of fame in this way owing to the birth of Alexander the Great, who was supposedly born on the day that Herostratus burned down the temple. As Professor Gregory L. Ulmer states in The Legend of Herostratus, we may imagine, then, that on the evening in 356 BC, as Herostratus passed by the familiar temple, runners from the court of Philip of Macedon were announcing the birth of the prince for whom great things were prophesied. The thought of this child, born into all the advantages of life and predestined for glory, made Herostratus reflect despairingly on his own frustrated ambitions, made him rage against his anonymity, mortality mediocrity. The idea here being that the announcement of a baby who was already more famous and well-known than he was so annoyed Herostratus that he burned down the largest, most opulent building that he could find, the Temple of Artemis. Plutarch also noted, it was this coincidence which inspired Hegesius of Magnesia to utter a joke which was flat enough to have put the fire out. He said, It was no wonder the Temple of Artemis was destroyed, since the goddess was busy attending to the birth of Alexander. But those of the Magi, who were then at Ephesus, interrupted the destruction of the temple as the portent of a far greater disaster. And they ran through the city, beating their faces and crying out that that day had brought forth a great scourge and calamity for Asia. As fun and widely repeated as this hypothesis is, color is skeptical. Ephesus was some 900 kilometers by land, or 500 kilometers or so, via the Aegean Sea from Alexander's birthplace in Pella. In other words, there was no way for anyone in Ephesus, including Herostratus, to know that Alexander had been born before he went and burned down the temple. That is, at least, if we are indeed assuming the two events did really happen at approximately the same time as stated. Further, Alexander was not Alexander the Great, as we think of him at this point so it seems unlikely that some Ephesian would care that a distant ruler had just been born. That said, some modern historians have speculated that ancient historians may have simply made these two events coincide, as it was something of a popular practice among historians to put significant events in history together on the same day, if they just so happen to occur reasonably close to each other in time. Whatever the case, it is noteworthy that during the rebuilding of the temple, Alexander the Great himself would offer to pay for it if they'd agree to put his name prominently on an inscription on the temple. But according According to Strabo, the Ephesians very tactfully refused, telling him, It is inappropriate for a god to dedicate offerings to gods, after which they continued to fund the project themselves, supposedly through taking collections from local citizens, including donations of jewelry and things like that. 
The subsequent temple was just as opulent, standing for about six centuries until the Goths sacked the city sometime between 260 and 270 AD. It isn't actually clear whether the Goths destroyed the temple or simply took all the valuables from it and damaged parts of it. But either way, whether rebuilt or repaired, its final end would come around 400 AD thanks to the rise of Christianity. It was at this point that its doors were closed and it was either destroyed and its stones used for other structures and statues and other valuables taken, or this just gradually happened over time from there. Whatever the case, it would be this rebuilt temple that Antipater of Sidon would note of this in the 2nd century BC. I have set eyes on the lofty wall of Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossal of the sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Morsalus. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy, and I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. Philo of Byzantium in the 3rd century BC would further state of the temple, The temple of Artemis in Ephesus is the only house of the gods. For whoever examines it will believe that the gods exchanged the heavenly regions of immortality to have a place upon the earth. Many other ancient sources would also ring in, generally noting that the temple of Artemis was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, structure ever built. But going back to Herostratus, very unfortunately for those of us who like all the details, other than that he apparently had a desire to be famous that was stronger than his desire to not be brutally tortured and die, we don't really know much of anything definitive about how he came to have such a desire for fame. But fame he got. Even today, some two millennia later, Herostratus lives on in our very language, lending his name to the term Herostratic fame, which is used to describe the actions of people who commit crimes solely to acquire fame fame or notoriety. Sir Thomas Brown sums this all up, noting, But the iniquity of oblivion blindly scattereth her poppy, and deals with the memory of men without distinction to merit of perpetuity. Herostratus lives that burnt the temple of Diana, he is almost lost that built it. Who knows whether the best of men be known, or whether there be not more remarkable persons forgot than any that stand remembered in the known account of time. And look, I'm not going to promise that Brilliant will make you famous for the rest of time, but I can promise you that you will learn something with them, and that's probably a whole lot better anyway. Now, you've heard me talk about Brilliant before. They're a learning platform that focuses on active learning. This is where you're given a short bit of information about a scientific concept, and then you're asked to solve a problem that is based on that information. This is an incredibly effective way to learn. In Brilliant's platform, as well as loads of different courses, they also have something called Daily Challenges. These are five minutes a day that you can use to exercise your brain and learn something new. Thousands of people have learned whether they weigh more in Helsinki or in Mexico City. They've calculated the area of a snowflake, or they've used expected value to decide whether to play a grifter's game. Each problem provides you the context and framework that you need in order to tackle the problem. This means that you can learn concepts by applying them. That's that active learning thing again. This sort of short daily practice can lead you from curiosity to mastery in far less time than you might think. So just go to brilliant.org forward slash brain food and finish your day a little smarter. And the first 200 of you to do that will get 20% off the annual subscription. And you'll also be able to view all of the problems in the archives. So go check out Brilliant. There is a link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.